this uh, return back, we defined flux. I'm going to now talk about time varying phenomena. Yeah. Sir, in the electrostatic case, yeah. we use almost two similar type of equation. Right. One is D is yes. equal to some constant is seven not into e. That is provided it's a linear material. Yes. Yeah. And plus P. Yeah. And here it is H, some constant one upon mu right. naught, H B minus M. So in one case there is a plus and in another case there is a minus. Yes. Is it only a matter of convention that two signs are different yes. or there the, is a the, physics the involved in it? This, that it is a direction of the uh, dipole moment that was defined as from negative charge to the positive charge. You will find I, that that is the uh, way it will turn out. Okay, sir. If someone changes the convention or no, if the convention had been the… convention, lots it, of things will change. Uh, had the convention be otherwise, then would we have expected similar type of equations in both the cases? Probably. But there, you know, conventions are very much of interest to physicists. You know, I mean, you change from a right-handed coordinate system to a left-handed coordinate system, your right-hand rule will change, right? So let's not worry about that, but this is the way it is. That, okay, but the effect is essentially the same. All right, so let me then uh, go over. Now, we already know what is a flux. I'm trying to recollect for you. Uh, remember that in the first lecture, I had a picture of a fisherman's net. So we said that, look, so the, the flux was defined as the B dot N ds. So let me look at, and we had sort of seen that del dot of B equal to 0. Now look at a, a situation like this. I have a fisherman's net here, and this is the rim. And I have a net outside. So suppose I am to talk about this surface, and then uh, outward normal will be perpendicular to this out of the net. The other one, if I take this, then the normal direction is outward like this. Then del dot of B will tell you, this is a very, very important point which, to which I am coming back, that whether you calculate the flux from this surface or from that surface, the flux is identical. It is a consequence of the fact that the del dot of B equal to 0. The, as long as the boundary is the same, on a given boundary, you can make many types of surfaces. For example, take the rim of a cup. You have a cup over it. So that is a surface. And if that rim which is circular, you put a disc on it, that becomes another surface. The, the flux turns out to be the same. Let us look at what is this electromotive force, okay? Remember motive force, it is a motion is connected. It is the most unfortunate nomenclature in physics because electromotive force is not a force. It is in the past when people had not understood what was happening. People had thought that, look, there is something which is forcing these charges, if you connect them to a battery, to move in a circuit. So it was thought to be a force and that is how the name came up. Okay? So this electromotive force, what is electromotive force? So you know that you define it as integral of E dot dl. But in essence, the circuits that you have are always closed circuit. An electrostatic force is a conservative force. The integral of E dot dl, contour integral of E dot dl over any closed circuit must be 0. That is the definition of conservative force. So therefore, I cannot understand if I, the only forces I had are the electrostatic force. The integral of E dot dl should be equal to 0. In which case, it cannot explain the dissipation that takes place via joule heat and things like that. Because there should be no losses there. It is a conservative force. Now, so what is actually happening there is this. That I have a battery. I have a battery which is providing, if you want me to still use the word motive force. Now, what the battery is doing, 
is to convert chemical energy to electrical energy. Okay? And what it does is to set up within that region of battery a non-conservative situation. A non-conservative field, I am calling it, let's say, E prime. So, my electromotive force, if you like, is given by the integral of E prime dot D. Now, you would be saying that if it is only within the battery, why did you put a contour integral there? But you see, it doesn't matter because the non-conservative force outside the battery is zero. So, its contribution to the contour integral is equal to zero. So, you could write it that integral E prime dot DL within the battery region or you could simply say in the outside field also. It doesn't matter. The, that is not the only interesting thing. If you define the total electric field to be a sum of the conservative part and a non-conservative part, E and E prime, let us call it E total. I can define my EMF to be integral of the total ET dot dl. The reason is that one part is conservative, so the like contour integral of that is 0. The second part is not 0, but then second part has a part within the battery and has a part outside the battery, the outside part is 0. So therefore, integral of total E dot dl is the same as this integral, which is my definition of the electromotive force. Okay. So let us summarize our understanding of the electromotive force. We said that the total electric field is sum of two parts. There is a conservative part, which is my electrostatic force, and there is a non-conservative part, where the battery is playing a role. The current density is a sum of both parts. The line integral of the conservative part outside the battery is exactly cancelled by the line integral of the conservative part within the battery. And that is the only way total integral can be 0. The other part is 0 because the non-conservative part outside the battery is 0. So that is our understanding. And that is in fact, I am no, do not have time to go for it. That is why there is always a talk of an open circuit voltage. That is between the terminals of a battery, there exists a voltage. You do not have to connect it, draw currents in order to talk about a voltage. You buy a battery from market and you can say its open circuit voltage is 1.5 volt, 9 volt or whatever you pay for. Okay? This is simply a method of talking about that what is its ability to draw current. Okay. Let me quickly come to the first of the time dependent phenomena, namely Faraday's law. I will accelerate this a little bit because most of these are very well done by you people. So firstly, the, the statement is very simple. Faraday had said a changing magnetic flux through a circuit gives rise to an EMF. Now this, what makes a magnetic flux change? Remember that flux is B dot ds. So either B itself could be changing or the area could be changing, both could be changing, the angle between them could be changing, all sorts of things could be happening. But Faraday's observation was, it is immaterial what changes. As long as there is a change in flux, whatever be its cause, it will result in an EMF. Later on, many names were given to it. For example, people say that if it was caused because of a relative motion. People called it the EMF to be motional EMF. Again, convention. If the magnetic field itself is changing, it will also give rise to a EMF, and there is no way to distinguish between them. So, Faraday's law was always stated like E is proportional to d phi by dt. Later on, you will find it is written as. E is equal to minus d phi by dt. This minus sign is very tricky. Do not take it as an algebraic sign. It is not an algebraic sign because minus sign was introduced to tell you about another law which goes with it. 
And that law is known as Lenz's law. Now the Lenz's law tells you that if what is the direction of current, not EMF, current, if I had an actual physical circuit connected by conducting material. Now remember, Faraday's law is true even if you had a circuit consisting of wood. I can have a magnetic field varying and I can have, let us say, circle made of wood and I can talk about how much is the EMF generated in that circuit. Because the definition of EMF has nothing to do with whether I have iron there or wood there. But current, there is a need. Because if you want to talk about current, that circuit cannot be wooden circuit, but it better be a conducting circuit. So Lenz's law said that what would be the direction of the current? If we are to have a circuit where there were conducting elements. And it says that that results in an induced current. The direction of that will be such as to oppose the cause which is making this change. It doesn't like. Okay? You try to increase the flux, the induced current will be generated in such a direction that is the effect of that induced current will be to produce a magnetic field which is in the reverse direction. So that it will try to decrease the flux. This minus sign was introduced by the people to tell you that there is a law called Lenz's law which tells you that the effect is to oppose changes. The nature does not like changes to occur. It wants status quo. Okay? So please don't take that minus sign as an algebraic quantity. So let, let me give you one example. Supposing I have a circuit which is in a magnetic field. Let's say that magnetic field is coming out of the plane of the uh, board. And let us suppose I stretch this a little bit. So I have a length here, dl, and I'm stretching it with a velocity v. So that in time dt, this length element gets stretched by v dt. Now then, what I do is this, that this has resulted in a change in the area which is given by V dt times this dl or cross because we have seen that an area can be regarded as a vector. So let's look at the Lorentz force again Q V cross P. So my EMF then is by definition E dot dl is force per unit charge which is V cross B dot dl. So that's equal to, this is A cross B dot DL, which you can rearrange using A dot B cross C equal to B dot C cross A, etc., etc., to a form like B dot del cross V. And del cross V, right? Because V is essentially dx by dt. So I write it as minus ds by dt, and you get this is equal to d phi by dt. So what has happened here is this, that the, we have said that if this is stretching with a velocity v, the area is changing with a velocity v, then the cause of this force is, this is a motional EMF. Its cause is the cause of the motion. The next problem I will not be doing because I am sure several times you have asked your students to do it. Basically, it is a loop which is moving uh, in one direction. And you can sort of see what actually, there is something interesting about it. There is a magnetic field coming out, there is a loop which is moving, let us say, in some, some direction. Now you see, if I am going to be take, talking about an integral around this loop, there are charges here, there are charges, charges are moving, assume there are positive charges which are moving. We know that, of course, the charge that moves is negative charges. But Now, these charges, because they are moving, and there is a magnetic field there, they are subject to Lorentz force, V cross B dot D. Now, the contribution to the integral from this side and that side will be zero. Because corresponding to every point here, there is a point here where you are traversing the 
in the opposite direction. This is an inhomogeneous field, not a constant field. So take any point, let's say here, and the corresponding point there. The strength of the magnetic field is the same. But because your length element is in the opposite direction, the contribution to that integral goes away. On the other hand, there will be opposite points even on this two. But the strength of the magnetic fields are not the same. As a result, there is contribution from this side and that side, and which results in this integral not being equal to zero. So that is the reason for the EMF here. Okay. Well, this is the same more or less, but since this is giving me the first of the Maxwell's equation, there is, let's talk about it. What we are saying is this, that the two examples that I gave you had motional EMF because they arose because of the charges in motion. Charges in motion are subjected to Lorentz forces and because of that we calculated different values of E dot dt. There is no way of saying or distinguishing whether the it is because of the motion or because of changing the magnetic field the flux changes. So let us look at this. This is my definition of the Faraday's law. Integral e dot dl is minus d phi by dt. But phi is b dot dl. So that is what it is. By Stokes law e dot dl is del cross e dot ds which is equal to minus d by dt of b dot ds. Bring everything to one side, you get del cross E plus dB by dt equal to 0. So del cross E, which was equal to 0 because we said electrostatic force is a conservative. Now we are saying del cross of E is minus dB by dt, okay? Minus dB by dt, this is what del cross E gives me. So this is a consequence of the fact that I have a time varying situation. The magnetic field, whatever the reason is, varied. Then my del cross E equation changes. Curl of E is no longer 0. So another way of looking at it is a changing magnetic field, the statement should be changing magnetic flux. But a changing magnetic field also gives rise to an equivalent electric field. And that changes the curl E equation. The curl of E is no longer 0. So let us look at some of the consequence thereof. Supposing I have two loops and uh, there are current through these loops. Now one of the things you should realize is that if there is a current in this loop, it creates a magnetic field around it this magnetic field is threaded by this loop. As a result, there is a flux through this loop. And if the, the current in this loop is changing with time, then the magnetic field that it generates also changes with time. As a result, the flux that is passing through loop number two also changes with time. But if the flux is changing with time, there is an EMF that will be generated in loop number two. And I can immediately write down by realizing that the field due to this loop is written as mu 0 by 4 pi dl1 cross pi. This is just by Savart's law. And the flux then is b1 dot ds2. Remember, I have put in 1 to say that the field is generated by loop 1 and the flux is because there is a, an area here. So notice, because this expression has B1. The flux through the second loop is proportional to the current in the first loop. That tells me that I can write the flux through the second loop as proportional to the current in the first loop and the proportionality constant can be calculated by all these integrals there. So Faraday's law will then tell me that the EMF generated in this loop due to the changing current in that loop is given by minus Lenz's law m21 times di1 by dt. This constant is called the mutual conductance. It is always a good idea 
to talk about mutual conductance before you have introduced self conductance and because it is much easier to you all realize that mutual conductance being lot more difficult to calculate one doesn't do it in school but it may be so but conceptually mutual conductance is much easier to understand than self conductance mutual conductance says the interaction between two bodies i am telling you you are listening it so this is a much easier thing to understand here is a person lecturing there is a person receiving it when you say i am lecturing and i am receiving there seems to be some confusion there okay now so this is mutual conductance because it is much easier to understand this is a seat of magnetic field this is threading it so the flux through it is changing since the current is changing the flux is changing flux is changing there is an emf in this circuit turn the table there is a current in this circuit which is also changing with time that will allow you for its flux to be intercepted by this okay and you can recalculate and show that the mutual inductance is a function of geometry only how they are placed so having said that now i have a loop i have a magnetic field produced now this magnetic field is not only threading the loops that there may be nearby it's also threading its own loop this is the whole idea that it's also because of the fact it is threading its own loop there is an emf generated in the loop itself i am giving you a lecture you are listening to me for almost 3 hours you are getting tired that's mutual inductance i am talking continuously i am getting tired that is self inductance <laughs> right now so therefore now you will realize try to do this problem in the class from first principle try to calculate the self inductance of a long straight wire you will realize how much of problem is there okay you will and do it by normal method not by saying half li square is the energy so therefore i can calculate energy by some other way and equate it do it by first principle it's not easy the so therefore this emf its job is actually to reduce the current that is flowing in this and hence it's called a back emf okay the it opposes the always the inductance or the effect of the faraday's law is to act as something which opposes the change it doesn't like change whether in another person or in yourself i told you to do self inductance calculation of self inductance of a long straight wire which i will not do if by the time you finish it you go to the december you have not succeeded just send me an email i will try to do it but do it for some simple case let us look at the self inductance of a solenoid tightly wound solenoid we know the magnetic field is mu0 ni with every term then since there is a constant magnetic field inside i link a flux which is equal to the area of each turn times the magnetic field which is mu0 ni so if the total length is l then total number of turns that i have is small n into l so total amount of flux linked is this much so l is d5 by dt which is simply given by this that gives you immediately an expression for what the self inductance is let us do the same thing suppose i had two solenoids which are tightly wound with each other much easier to calculate so you you know the field so you have let's you you are putting in a current i through one of them and through the other one also look at that if you are changing the current i through one of them how much is the flux linked in the other one and you can get an expression for the mutual inductance we already had ex found out the expression for the self inductance of a single solenoid you can check that m12 is simply the geometrical mean of the two self inductance that's provided everything is tightly 
wound and things like that. Mutual inductance is a very sensitive function of geometry. Let's come to the following thing. Now, when I establish a current in the circuit, remember what, what we do? We switch on, right? The process of switching on is a very interesting thing. The current was zero before you switched it on. The fact that you have switched on, it means in a short time, the current went from zero to whatever its value would be after the switch was put on. So in other words, there is a changing current. It's a simple thing which you do every day. Go to a room, switch on. The process of switching on changes the current from zero to whatever value it is. If that happens then, the, because the current is established in the circuit, I must have an induced EMF developing. Now, so when this induced EMF, which I know is a back EMF develops, work must be done to oppose it. Because otherwise I can never establish a current to my desired value. And of course the same thing that if there are more than one conductors then you have to also change the current in the other circuits because of that. Let us look at energy of a current distribution. So we said what is the flux? Supposing I have got a large number of circuits. What is the flux through let us say ith circuit? So we said ith circuit flux changes because of current in that circuit. self inductance is proportional to the current. So I write it as Li II. Small i means ith circuit. It also, there is a component due to change in the current in the other circuit, J naught equal to i. Here a self inductance comes, here a mutual inductance comes. So my EMF, which is d phi i by dt, EI, the EMF on the ith circuit, that is simply obtained by writing something over d by dt of this, li di i by dt plus mij dij by dt. So the rate at which the work is done is simply EI ii, and if you write that, you can write it, this is li multiplying with i di i by dt, which is same as d i square by dt. And likewise, in this expression, you have multiplied an i, so I have written it as d i i i j by dt. I need a factor of 1 by 2 because chain rule differentiation. Okay. So this work done, okay, total work done, I can express in terms of, see this is my definition of the work done. Electric field, e i, and this emf I have seen is, ha, this is the expression for that. So i i was there, i i square and things like that. And this is simply the expression for i i phi i. I'm just going through one of them. Phi is b dot ds. So I convert this to by Stokes law to a dot j. Now let's come to a different situation. So we have talked about changing current. Now suppose in a circuit, I have a current, but I also have, let us say, a capacitor. But before that, let me ask the following question. We said a changing magnetic field gives rise to an electric field. Naturally, people have realized by that time, there is a lot of similarity between or symmetry between electric field and the magnetic field. So the question naturally arises, if a time varying magnetic field gives rise to an equivalent electric field because EMF is nothing but integral E dot dl. What would happen if I were to change the electric field with time? Will it give me a magnetic field or not? Now, this actually comes back to the fact that magnetic effects are a lot more difficult to observe. So changing magnetic field gave rise to an electric field which could be easily demonstrated experimentally. But it was not known for a very long time. 
whether a changing electric field will give rise to a magnetic field just because it's a small effect and in fact that is basically the contribution of maxwell into the whole game you you notice that we had uh, gauss's law del dot of b equal to 0 del dot of p equal to rho by epsilon 0 we had a faraday's law del cross of e equal to minus db by dt we had ampere's law but ultimately the whole set of equations came to be known as maxwell's law equation so what did maxwell actually do if all the work were done by other people you know why did maxwell get the credit maxwell was able to get this last mile and last mile is very important i mean you may have a fiber optic cable running in the nearby but if you don't have a cat5 cable which is coming to your home this is a useless proposition so that's what he did and the he answered it in a very simple way he said let us look at the following situation supposing i have a current flowing in a circuit in which i have a capacitor now what is happening when i switch on the current in the circuit the capacitor is getting charged now so i have a circuit the capacitor is getting charged the question that he wanted to know is this during the process of charging current is not zero you see if it is a dc you have a capacitor because the capacitor there is an air gap the current will not be there but we are not talking about that we are talking about a situation which happens just before the charging takes place there is a process of charging is delivering the charges from the battery onto the plates of the capacitor during that time charges are moving from the battery through the external circuit to the plates of the capacitor so there is a current at that time now this current we will call as a conduction current because that is what exists in the outside circuit now suppose i considered a loop here threading that area then i can use the ampere's law to say integral b dot dl equal to mu zero i but then what was done is the following we have just now said that the flux that is calculated okay so this is what i'm doing i have said that this is supposing this is the surface s1 which is just the plane of that loop so you could convert that equation into del cross b equal to b0 j by simply using your stokes law now suppose instead you decided that i will still consider the same loop but will not take the disk as the surface but we will imagine that with the same loop as the rim there is a pot and part of that pot goes between the capacitors now we have said that the flux is independent of which surface you take but what happens now the problem is that there is that part of the pot is not cutting any current because there is no physical conduction current inside a capacitor but the calculation must be the same so there is a conflict so earlier this would seem to suggest del cross of b equal to 0 because there is no current there but earlier we had said del cross of b equal to mu zero j now same physical situation two different calculations cannot give me the two different results and this is what maxwell did he said his thinking was this some of these thinking have led to wrong names okay his thinking was that imagine instead of vacuum that space between the capacitor had some medium material medium then since you have 
set up charges. In other words, that material medium has now put in an electric field. This will lead to charge separation within that. And we go back now to how much is the flux. The flux through S2, then he calculated, as we had done it earlier, as surface is S2, but it is d dot ds. Now, in that case, my d phi e by dt is d by dt of d dot ds, and this is a time differentiation, there is a space integration. You can bring that in, which will become d dot ds is del dot d dq bar. So you can show that d phi e by dt is equal to dq by dt because rho del dot d is actual charge rho. That's the reason I brought in d, real charge. But rho dq bar is nothing but q. So which tells me that the change in the electric flux is the same as dq by dt, which is the current in the outside circuit. So now we are left with the last bit of our equations that we need to now change del cross h we have a del cross e equation so we have a del cross b equal to mu 0 j which is same as del cross h equal to mu j so to that we now needed to add a term which is because of the changing well it is d the what was called as displacement field so this tells me, well you can immediately see that if you do del dot del cross h, it will give rise to continuity equation. So with this, we have now established all the equations which go in the name of Maxwell's equation. Good to see them in one place always. I have del dot of E equal to rho by epsilon 0. Repeat again, this E is the real electric field. Rho is not just the real charge density. Rho is the actual charge density, real or induced, put together. Del dot of B equal to 0, there is nothing that I can do to it. This is these two equations. Remember, this equation is the only one which has remained unscatched in our discussion. Del dot of E has remained rho by epsilon 0, but our idea of what rho is has changed. Rho is now not only the free charges, but also the induced charges. So that equation has changed, though it doesn't look like having changed, but it has changed. Second equation doesn't change because nature has not provided us with any magnetic monopoles. The third equation that is there is what is known as Faraday's law. The curve changing magnetic field is equivalent to an electric field, induced electric field. So del cross of E and minus sign as I told you is the Lenz's law. It opposes. The next one is changing electric field though it is always written in terms of D, D D by dt. Okay. So the thing is that D as we know is our mental idea about the field that would be produced if somehow or other we could switch off the inducing activity. It is not something which I can actually calculate excepting in case of linear material where we say D and E are proportional. It is unfortunately uh, their names have stuck but today the fashion is to say vector D okay, without a name and a vector H. Okay? The only when you consider linear material, then H is proportional to B, mu times B, that is called permeability. But most material are not linear. I want to know the physical meaning of current as well as displacement current. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The name is only displacement current, it has nothing to do with displacement. The name came because original idea of Maxwell was to explain it in terms of the separation of charges by putting it in the medium. So forget about the name. The question is what is D is what you are asking. Okay? Nowadays, no physicist uses the name displacement vector. Displacement current is used. See, if you have a current passing in the outside circuit, 
continuity demands that inside the capacitor, right, there has to be a continuous thing because outside it comes out. Now that quantity, whatever it is, has to have the dimension of current, right? So, but however, in order to understand it, what it is, you have to give it a different meaning, which is what we did. We showed that if you realize what is the changing electric field inside the capacitor, right? Its time rate of change is equivalent to a quantity which has the dimension of current. Okay. And the, this quantity that you calculate is exactly equal to the conduction current in the outside circuit. So that is what is known as the displacement current. Okay? But unlike the physical current, displacement current is not something which is flowing. Okay? It's a name given because it has a dimension of current. Is it clear? Okay. Now, so therefore, my equations are these. Del dot of B equal to rho by epsilon 0, I told you E is the actual field. Del dot of B equal to 0. Del cross E, Faraday's law. This is Ampere Maxwell's law. Del cross H should have been equal to J only. Because del cross B is mu 0 J. If H and B are proportional, then only a factor of mu should come. But then I have a factor which is due to changing electric field, d dy dt. These set of four equations are collectively called as Maxwell's equations. Always along with this, I need two footnotes. That's the question was being asked. What is d? d is being defined. D is being defined in terms of measurable quantities. D is being defined as epsilon 0 E, I can measure E, plus the polarization vector. And likewise, H is being measured in terms of B and the magnetism vector. So they are called constitutive relations because they introduce two auxiliary fields, namely D and H. The fields that we are we always talk about in physics are always E and V. Okay? But if you are doing electrodynamics, these will also be there. Okay. Suppose I want to now rewrite Maxwell's equations, not in terms of E and B, but in terms of the corresponding potentials. I have a scalar potential and I have a vector potential. Definition of scalar potential is minus the gradient of phi is the electric field. Definition of vector potential is the curl of the vector potential is the magnetic field. So in those equations that I had, del cross of E equal to minus, this is Faraday's law. Del cross E is minus dv by dt. So if I substitute B to be equal to del cross A, then you notice that I can write this equation by taking this term to the other side as del cross of E plus dA by dt equal to 0. Right? Now then, since this is the curl of a quantity equal to 0, this entire quantity is expressible as gradient of a potential. Now, now please understand what's happening because I'm we said in the electrostatic field, since the electric field was conservative, del cross of E was equal to 0, E could be written as minus grad phi. Now I am saying something else. I am saying E is not conservative if you have time dependence. But though E is not conservative, some quantity called E plus dA by dt seems to be conservative. What is that quantity? I don't know. A is not, E is not conservative because del cross of E is no longer zero. But I have shown that if you add to E some quantity like dA by dt, that has a curl equal to zero. But any quantity whose curl is equal to zero, you should be able to write it as, let's say, minus grad phi. So this is what we did. So we said E is equal to minus grad phi plus dA by dt. It is immaterial. See, we always use minus because our potential's definition is minus gradient of phi. Okay? But 
Any mathematics book, they don't care. If del cross of a quantity is equal to zero, that quantity is expressible as gradient of a scalar. It is minus del V minus dou A by dou T or plus dou A by dou T. Listen to me. It is, this quantity, this quantity, E plus dA by dt. Yes. Okay? If I write it as, uh, oh, I think there is a sign problem. Doesn't minus matter. sign. That is minus sign. Doesn't matter. I know. You know, what, whenever such things are pointed out, I tell my students that these are the jobs of accountants, not physicists. So don't worry about it. This, there's an error, so there is an error. It has to be corrected. Okay. Now, in the vacuum, look at this, because that's all that I'm going to do. Del dot of E is rho by epsilon 0. So put it back there. So what you get is an equation for del square V. Now if you get an equation for del square V, but remember del square V is written in terms of A. I can look at the another equation. This I have to flash. So if you look at the second equation, you find, do some manipulation, don't make the mistake that I did, you will get equations of this type. Yeah, I mean, I agree that there is a minus sign difference. It doesn't matter. Now, these equations can be actually decoupled. This can be decoupled because we have a lot of liberty with respect to choosing a gauge. So what one does, you remember I talked about Coulomb gauge which said del dot of A equal to 0. But now it turns out that if instead of Coulomb gauge, you choose another gauge in which del dot of A is not equal to 0, but you take that del dot of A is equal to minus 1 over c square dv by dt. If you do that, that's called a Lorentz gauge, then you find these two equations become decoupled. And these equations are nothing but wave equations. So with that, I think it's good to conclude. Thank you very much.